Well, good, e good evening, everybody. I now understand how my college professors felt when I sat all over in the back of the room and not the front three rows. Um, a little bit better than I did tonight, but um, it was great to be with you guys again. Welcome to our second week of neighboring. Um, first and foremost, uh, many of you have asked me about uh, Lynn and Diana, how she's doing. She is home, um, resting. Um, still no kind of progress for her. Um, and so I said, I told Len, I was like, hey, you need to stay there and, and be present at home. And so he's there watching her and taking care of her. Um, and so your continued prayers are, are greatly appreciated um, for Diana and, and for the Flack family. Um, so normally he would be here and this was actually his night. He was really excited about it. Um, but um, I told him, I was like, nope, I think it's better that you're there at home for right now. So... Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started for our evening on our second week. But before we do, let's pray uh, over our evening tonight. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. You, God, are uh, the God of all creation, Lord, sustaining the word, the world by the word of your power. Lord, so grateful that you hold all things in your hands, Lord, and that one day all things will be put into submission to Christ. Father, so grateful for uh, the fact that you have um, created us uh, in your image to be in relationship with you, but also, Lord, to represent you here. Father, as we continue our study on neighboring, Lord, I pray that your word would be a light and a lamp unto our feet, Father, and that you would continue to grow us, mold us, and shape us, Father, for your glory here in this place. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, so last week we had an opportunity to talk about loving your neighbor and your neighborhood. And tonight we're going to be looking at the question of kind of why, what's, what's our, our motivation for that? And, and ultimately what is something that, uh, will last. And so this is actually a, a little bit trickier than you might first think because we're living in a world that's passing away, right? I mean, it's day by day. Um, each of us are, are realizing that uh, not only our own mortality, but the reality is that our world is, is not uh, eternal. Um, and so there may be the question in your mind, like, well, if the world is passing away and there are, this is a temporary piece, um, is there really value in loving our neighbor or, and, and even, you know, even if they're not going to become a Christian? Or um, even more, maybe on a structural level, is there real value in um, caring for my neighborhood um, or, or a school district um, or fixing a sidewalk if that sidewalk and that school really aren't built to last? They're wasting away. They're temporary. So I mentioned last week that our ultimate aim is love. That's our ultimate aim. And so when we think about neighboring, it's to really love our neighbors, um, to see them come to faith in Christ, right? We talked about the ultimate goal is, is the ultimate loving thing is to, dem to share the gospel with them and see them come to faith. But I also said that it's, that's not the only thing that matters. Love that's less ultimate is still important. So why does this maybe middle speed of not ultimate but still important, does it really still have value? Are these things okay? Right? Because typically we have two gears, right? Like the important things and the unimportant things. Some of us are a little more black and white, so we see unimportant, important. And that's really what we're going to kind of look at today, that if this world is passing away and um, human souls are all that really are eternal, why does love for our neighbor even matter when the neighbor's soul is not saved? Why does love for neighborhood matter, even though that neighborhood is fleeting and will ultimately be destroyed and God will recreate all things new? Well, I mean, working to reform a local school, bring a neighbor grocery bags, give a smile to someone you'll never see again. What's the value in that? We might be asking ourselves. Do we divide our life into spiritual things like evangelism, church, um, those items, and then maybe into temporal things, planting a flower bed, caring for our home, um, you know, doing something in terms of investing in our neighbor or neighborhood, which may be temporary, 
Are those eternally less worth? Are they maybe eternally worthless because they're going to pass away? Or is there more going on? And, and, and I would suggest that there is more going on here, which is what we're going to unpack today. I'll warn you, of all four classes, this one is the most uh, theoretical uh, of the four. A lot, again, we're going to provide a lot of practicalities in our next couple ones. But I think we need to understand really what the Bible has to say about the value of neighboring before we can kind of look at the next two weeks to apply the topic more fully. And I'll start by setting up the, the problem that results when we only have the two categories of, of important and not important at all. And then what we're going to try and do uh, is put that problem in the context of Scripture's teaching about um, kingdom. Remember our two kingdom teaching at our last uh, focus community. And finally, we'll find the solution to the problem in the Bible's teaching about image bearing, being an image bearer uh, of God. So if you look at your handout, we're going to talk about the problem. And so really, we, we lack multiple speeds of importance at times. If we're going to love our neighbor well, and our neighborhoods well, we're going to have to have categories for things that are valuable in God's eyes, but are less than ultimate. The problem is that Oftentimes, we as Christians think that we uh, do either completely important or completely unimportant things. And we may think about this in terms of what value is there? Is it, is it really a value to take the trash out for my neighbor versus telling them about Jesus? But I fear that if, when we adopt that mindset, it, it generally leads to two approaches. And so these kind of two airs, if you will. The first error is under point two on your handout, that only spiritual things are important. This is the first error. And by this, I mean that everything gets reduced to the Great Commission as all that it truly matters. Go therefore make disciples uh, of all the nations, teaching them, uh, baptizing them, and teaching them all that I have commanded you to do. Or, even if we don't adopt that approach in theory, we adopt it practically and just don't find time for anything that's neither necessary nor expli explicitly spiritual. We feel, like uh, we feel like time we invest in neighbors can feel like a waste if conversions never turn to spiritual things, or I'm sorry, conversations never turn to spiritual things. We're the ones uh, who never make it to the neighborhood picnic, possibly, who never have time to hang out or talk on the sidewalk at the, at the end of the driveway or the the mailbox. We wouldn't volunteer at the local school unless it's a Christian school group, uh, like um, the um, oh my goodness, Child Evangelism Fellowship. Maybe we are the neighbors who are relatively unconcerned about the neighborhood because we have more important things in mind. This is a, a I think, an error when we think only spiritual things are important. Uh, on the other hand, the other uh, air, if you will, is, is that at times other Christians see the problem with that reductionistic approach, and so they take up a second air. They want to put every aspect of loving their neighbors, evangelism, fighting hunger, reforming education, on the same level. So sharing the gospel is just as important as planting your neighbor's bulbs. And again, the the same root, they're treating things as either ultimate or unimportant, but now everything becomes ultimate to them. So in that terminology, planting trees is just as much as being on mission as sharing the good news of Jesus, like I said. Improving crop yields becomes missions, and hosting neighborhood picnics become evangelism. In our early 20th century here, this mindset... Uh, Sorry, we're in the 21st century. But in the early 20th century, this uh, mindset pervaded uh, theological liberal mainline denominations as part of a theological movement called post-millennialism. The basic idea of post-millennialism was that this world will get better and better and better until Jesus finally comes back at the end of the millennia, the thousand years. Well, um, I don't know if you watched the news today versus 20 years ago uh, or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. If you've lived any bit of life, um, I think that's a hard view to kind of look at. But in the early 20th century, that was the, a very prominent view. 
But the, really, the reality is, is that two world wars in the 20th century really cut the heart out of post-millennialism. Yet, there's another mindset that's really kind of a, a modern parallel to post-millennialism, and it's something called Reconstructionism. Reconstructionism. Reconstructionism uh, begins with the idea that as a Christian, acting as salt and light in the world, we can and should transform culture and our society. Now, it's certainly true that the gospel does that. It, it transforms individuals and can produce profound social um, improvement. The elimination of the legal slave trade in the 19th century is one of history's great examples, I think, of that truth. But I think we should be cautious about the extent to which uh, the gospel will transform society in this life. Of course, God is going to someday remake this earth when he sets creation free from its bondage to decay. Romans 8, 21 tells us that. And that's something that will happen at the end of time. We shouldn't, make, we shouldn't take these promises there about the new heavens and new earth and pretend as if they were made about the here and now or acting as if, I think which is worse, we act as if we're the ones that bring them about. No, we do not. Christ is the one who redeems, reconciles, transforms. God is the one who recreates a new heavens and a new earth. You see, transformationalists, they see the church's mission as renewing and redeeming the culture. And as I just said, that's not the church's job. That is the work of Christ. He is the only Savior and Redeemer. Our role as the church is to testify to this truth and to point others to the one who brings this about. So let me connect this back to our, our topic of neighboring, these two heirs, if you will. So if we fall into the first heir, I'm afraid we don't often be very good neighbors. If we fall into the ear that spiritual things are the only important things, we're not very good neighbors. We'll share the gospel. And that's, I think, an incredibly loving thing to do. We would say it's the, the ultimate loving thing to do. But we won't find time for less robust speeds of love, if you will, that are also important. Caring for, providing meals, loving our neighbors in tangible ways. Or our love will also, in this category, this air, the love will be utilitarian, simply as a means to an end of evangelism. Remember, we talked last week about it feeling like an ulterior motive. We don't want that. Uh, on the other hand, on this second air, if we fall into that of everything falls under the aspect of loving our neighbors, we're setting ourselves up for a lot of disappointing expectations. When we see this world continue to head downhill and we might even stop sharing the gospel, what's the point? No, nothing's getting better. No matter how often I share the gospel, there is still hunger and strife and difficulty and death. The world is not getting better. I think both problems um, come from seeing things as either ultimate or unimportant, these polar ends, if you will. And so let me, let's think of an analogy from uh, the family setting. What's most important? The love between a husband and a wife or the love of parents for kids? It's a hard question to answer, isn't it? But I think for anybody who has children, you would understand and, and, and recognize, and as the Scripture even teaches us, that the, the love between husband and wife is of most importance. Love in the marriage is foundational for everything else. But that doesn't mean that the kids are unimportant. The love for them is absolutely important. You'd be concerned if a, a wife said that because loving her husband is the most important thing, that she can't love her children. But like evangelism is most important so we can neglect every other good thing we might do in a neighborhood. You would also be concerned on the other side of things. If, if someone said that loving the kids was just as important or even more important than loving their spouse. Now, love in a, in a marriage, in the marriage relationship that God has designed, is ultimate, at least in, in this analogy. But it can't be alone. It can't be alone. 
So how do we get our theology straight then so that uh, we can love well and have a, a, a multi-speed type love, right? I want us to see that both types of this problem uh, have its root in misunderstanding of how the two kingdoms really uh, work together and what is of so much importance, right? We looked at that last year at this time. And so I'll give a, a brief reminder of those things. Last year, we looked at uh, this, I, this model of, of two kingdoms that we see in the Scripture. The first is that Jesus comes declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of heaven, uh, Christ's redemptive kingdom. We call uh, in this two kingdom model, we see God's redemptive kingdom, that which he is, is seeking to bring about. And when Jesus comes, he begins to, he inaugurates it, but it has not yet finished. God's redemptive kingdom. And inside God's redemptive kingdom, God has his people under his rule in his place. That's the redemptive kingdom. So it's an already begun, but it's a not yet completed. But then we also see, and I think in a very fitting way, Jesus says this to Pilate in John 18. When he looks, and Pilate is looking at Jesus as he's examining him, and he says um, that you're the king of the Jews. And Jesus looks at him, and this is his reply in John 18, 36. He says, um, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus here is making a very important, and I think a profound distinction, that in the here and now, in this created order that God has created, this is a different kingdom. And we call that the common kingdom, that which is of our creation here and now. So, redemptive kingdom, where God's place with God's people under God's rule. That ceased to exist here on earth in Genesis chapter 3. And so, everything from then has been common kingdom. That's not where Jesus rules. His kingdom is not of this world. And so, we see Jesus, he's not denying being king here, but he doesn't deny that he rules over all creation with supreme authority either. But he does, once again, highlight, I think, a distinction we've seen. Doesn't focus on the common kingdom because he recognizes it's temporary, it's fleeting, it's passing away. Instead, he says, listen, my kingdom's not of this world. That's because the redemptive kingdom is a spiritual and eternal kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean it's somehow immaterial or not as real as the common kingdom, but it does mean its origin and purpose are different. Each of these kingdoms have different origins and purposes. All right, another passage that begins to highlight and helps us understand um, the differences between these two kingdoms here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 Paul writes these words to the church of Philippi. He says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. So we see, you and I, we are residents of this common kingdom. We are um, citizens of the United States of America. We are residents of upstate New York. Okay, So we have this residency here, but as we've often talked about and is, and is very commonly heard, we are to be in this world, but not of this world. Okay, Paul here really highlights this and reminds us that our what the most important citizenship we've ever had is not to be a citizen of the greatest nation in the world, I believe. But your greatest citizenship is in heaven. See, God ordained the way He created all things at the very beginning. He ordained that we live in and participate in the common kingdom. After all, the, the Great Commission work which God has given us, Matthew 28, is meant to be carried out, not in the redemptive kingdom, in the here and now, in the common kingdom, the common kingdom on the earth. 
But we also know, thankfully, that this world is not our home. This is not our home. We are in this world, but we are ultimately, for those in Christ, we are of the redemptive kingdom of Christ. And so therefore, our greatest allegiance, our greatest allegiance is to Jesus and the redemptive kingdom work that He is doing. I want us to notice that verse 21 ends and it says, Christ is empowered to subject all things to Himself. Just redemptive kingdom things, just spiritual things, some some common kingdom things. Now, I believe that what the Word tells us here is all. When, When He says all, He means all, everything. Even the things of the common kingdom one day will be put in subject to Christ. So how often we proclaim Jesus is Lord over all, we're saying not just over His redemptive kingdom pieces, but over His created order and the common kingdom as well. So, when we acknowledge this truth that Jesus is Lord over all, we're making an acknowledgement of a true statement from the Scriptures, but also really a political statement. He is the ultimate emperor, the ultimate king, the one sovereignly ruling over all, and it reminds us that the power and authority delegated by God to the common kingdom is actually lesser than the redemptive kingdom, and is subject to Jesus as well. Okay, well, if we have that understanding, does that mean that the the common kingdom is not important? These temporal things, should we not worry about them? You know, they're un, they fit in that unimportant category. No, I, I actually think, based on what we've seen here, is that because Christ will and all things will become subject to Him, and because in the beginning God created all things we see that the redemptive kingdom is our greatest allegiance. And yet, the common kingdom still has value, just not ultimate value. But it's not unimportant value. It's somewhere in that middle, okay? God's given us the Great Commission to accomplish these things in the here and now. He's created us, as Paul tells us in Corinthians 5, right? To the ministry of reconciliation, we are God's ambassadors. You know what ambassadors do? They go to other nations and represent the interest of their home nation. That's what we are. We are embassy workers. We just represent a kingdom that's not of this world. But that doesn't mean that the kingdom that we're in has no importance to it. It just has a lesser value than the ultimate eternal kingdom. Well, as as I mentioned we talked about this redemptive kingdom. It's at hand, as Jesus said. It's already here, but not yet realized. And we are the physical representations, the visible representation of Christ's kingdom here on earth, the church. And we are called to be a covenant people on mission with God. So together, we wait with eager anticipation for Christ's second advent, His second coming, when He puts a final end to Satan, sin, death, and visibly rule for all eternity. But until then, until that day, we, are, we have a, a, a dual citizenship, if you will. We are already citizens of the redemptive kingdom, and yet we remain in the con kingdom as ambassadors. Okay, So maybe dual citizenship isn't the best description there. Heaven is our citizenship. We're ambassadors in the common kingdom, representing what the interests of our home, our ultimate home. And so we have feet firmly planted, really, in both kingdoms. This means we have responsibilities in both. You and I, we have responsibilities here in the common kingdom. Work is one of those, believe it or not. Because work was one of the few things that God gave us before the fall. It just is a lot harder afterwards. So when we consider the fact that we have feet in both of these I think the thing what we need to follow is Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. Jesus says what to us? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Even here, Christ puts our primary duty as redemptive kingdom citizens 
of Christ, first and foremost. And so the church, made up of the redeemed people of God, are called to advance the gospel. And yet we are also called to serve as a prophetic witness in the common kingdom, witnessing of the redemptive kingdom. In the world, but not of the world. And as individuals, we should desire for our Christian worldview to have the greatest impact possible as we engage the world around us. We should want our worldview to have the greatest impact around us. However, we must also be sure not to neglect our responsibilities as residents of this world. Though we are not of this world, we're certainly in it, and that is by God's divine design. Trust me, friends, I don't understand it fully. I, if I created all of this, I wouldn't have done it this way, but this is how God's designed it in His masterful way. And so, as the, the Scripture tell us, what should we do in the midst of the common kingdom? Well, I think Peter gave us some really great examples. Peter says, pray for your civil authorities, for those in power over you. We should submit to them so long as they do not cause us to violate God's word. We should pay our taxes, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but give unto God what is his. We should feel free to participate in government through voting and communication with our authorities and maybe even seeking office. I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. In short, we should live and work in the common kingdom. We should build and create here. We should enjoy the arts and recreation while we're here. Because we know that this present age will pass away. But until that day, Christ's people should seek to be salt and light. Well, think about it. Salt. Salt is a, a flavoring and a preservative. Preserving something in the midst of our culture that is, let's be honest, eroding fast. And we should be light, the, the voice demonstrating and putting on display the, the voice of godliness and truth and, and highlighting the things of God. So these, I think this is at the root of the issue to, for us to think about the fact that oftentimes we think that this kingdom, eternal things, are the, are the ultimate and the only important piece. And so I hope what we've seen is that the common kingdom has redemptive, has an ability for us to care for it and love it, has value because it's also part of God's creation. So I want to root that then in, okay, in the solution here and understanding that, okay, well, in Scripture, where do we find the reasoning really for investing in this common kingdom? And I've kind of hinted at it a little bit. And the answer has to do with our role as image bearers. And that's point four in your handout. As we, as we do this, Let's pick up our two questions from earlier. What's the value of loving a non-Christian neighbor who never comes to faith in Christ? And what's the value of investing in our neighborhood itself to make it better and more just a place to live? More, and more than just a place to live. Well, let's think back to Genesis chapter 1. God creates. He assigns value. Five days, he says, it is good. On the sixth day, he says, it is very good when he creates man and woman. Well, why is there an extra sense of value there? I think because of what distinguishes us from the rest of creation. Verse 27, we're made in God's image. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It's the fact that we bear God's image that makes all people equally valuable. And we've talked about this uh, in November, didn't we? That each of us made in the image of God have value, worth, and dignity. Verse 28 tells us uh, how to act to represent God's rule and reflect His character, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and every living thing. So we represent God as His image bearers by filling the world and by ruling it, filling it with relationships and family and society, ruling it by creating order out of chaos, work, broadly defined, if you will. That's how we live consistently with being made in his image. We fill the world with his images. We act like him on his behalf as we exercise dominion. It's interesting if you think about it, relationship and work. Oftentimes, it's the world's idols, aren't they? Who I know defines me. We have a, a celebrity culture in our world. 
that exemplifies, man, if I knew somebody, I knew somebody, I, I want to be like them, this relationship piece, but then also work. The value that people place on work, it's the most important thing. What I do defines me. This is who I am. They're what the world says at times gives you value, your work and your relationships. This world says you're valuable because of what you do, who you know, who you love, and yet the Scripture tells us that you're valuable because of whose you are as an image bearer. Because your existence testifies to the goodness of who God is. What you do is important because it shows off in whose image you are made. Which means that your life matters because of what it says about God, not because of how much you accomplish. Interesting also that in Genesis chapter 3, God curses relationships and work. The same thing he commands in chapter 1, 128, really doesn't function apart from 127. But in Genesis chapter 3, your relationships will have strife. Your work will have strife. So, our actions don't make us valuable before God, and yet they are still valuable in His sight. And so why is what we do valuable in His sight? I believe it's because we accomplish these things for Him. Because we're productive. No? I think there's more to it. I think there's more going on than that. Because the reality is, is that in the grand scheme of history, God is accomplished, capable of accomplishing His purposes and everything He needs to do without us. Am I egotistical or self-centered enough to think that God cannot accomplish His purposes without me? Instead, I think that there's value in our actions because our doing them puts on display something about God. Not because it accomplishes something or is productive, but in our work, in our relationship, in our actions, we're saying something to be true about the one true God. The value of our actions is rooted not only in what they accomplish a little bit, but primarily in what they say about God. So I want to take that concept and apply it to what we're talking about during the first half of class tonight. That middle speed of love, that in-between ultimate and unimportant. So And see kind of hopefully why it has value. And that value isn't limited to love creating something that will last into eternity. A new creation in the case of loving your neighbor or, or the new creation in the case of loving your neighborhood. Instead, that middle speed of love has value because in it, we have an opportunity to demonstrate the glory and goodness of our God. The love of neighbor demonstrates the love worthiness of the God in whose image you're made. Love of neighbor shows off the power of God's love and work in your life. Love of neighbor shows off the love of God as we imitate Him. So, why should we love our neighbors, even if that love doesn't ultimately factor into God giving them saving faith? Because as we, as those who are made in God's image, they, your neighbor, are worthy of love. Remember, value, dignity, worth. Your neighbor is worthy of God's love. They are equal in dignity, value, and worth. Loving them demonstrates, testifies to our love for God and ultimately God's love for them. Well, why might we love the neighborhood, even though it's not eternal, but temporal, and it's passing away? Because in doing structural good to improve the lives of those around us, we get to represent the goodness of God. Because that neighborhood is filled with God's image bearers, and God desires for each of us to thrive, to do well, to enjoy our life. We don't have to root the value of structural good in some kind of um, connectivity between uh, the eternality, uh, the eternal things. No, we can 
we can find value in love in the neighborhood because that love shows off the goodness and the glory of God, His value of His creation. Even though it is corrupt and will one day pass away and a new creation will be here, it has value. I liken it a little bit to like this. Maybe you had a favorite toy when you were a kid. And you played with it and you played with it and you played with it. And then one day, something broke on it. But you loved that toy so much. And even though it didn't function right, I had a, I had a, a wooden semi when I was a, a little kid. We had gotten these, uh, a whole semi trailer from, uh, for Christmas. And the semi truck had a wheel in the front and then two axles in the back. Well, one of those axles broke. I didn't throw it out. It still had value and worth and dignity, even though it didn't work properly. And then eventually one day the hitch broke and it didn't carry the trailer. And eventually the, the pipe broke off. But you know what? I kept that truck because I valued it. It, it had meaning to me. It was a gift from my, my parents. Just because it didn't function properly didn't mean I, I threw it out. If you think about that, that, that's where our culture has gone, hasn't it? Everything is so disposable now. Something breaks, you just throw it out and order a new one on Amazon. So here the next day, now that we have two huge facilities here. No. In a similar fashion, God doesn't look at his creation and go, you know what? One day I'm just going to wipe all of that away so it doesn't have value now. No. If that was the case, God wouldn't have sent Christ to redeem a broken humanity, to reconcile our broken hearts to him to provide a means for us to be back in relationship with Him. God didn't look upon our poor estate and go, yeah, one day I'm going to remake it anyway, just leave it. No, He looked on our poor estate and said, I love you, I value you, I will send my Son for you. And now that I've done that, I've left you in the world to represent me and put my love on display. You see, when we look at Genesis 127 and 128, the world looks at the value in work and relationship and, it, and it, it separates it, it divorces it from 127 that roots it in the image of God. See, because when they do that, love for our neighbor only matters if we see the fruit of, of work. You know, our, our love for neighborhood and our love for our neighbor has value. We should see our primary purpose for our love, both in loving our neighbor and in loving the neighborhood in the statement they make about the glory and goodness of God. So then, how does your work of neighboring show off the glory and goodness of God? I'll give you five quick ones to wrap us our time up tonight. First, neighboring is one way that... Our obedience is demonstrated, and we show off the work of God in our hearts through the gospel. As one forgiven by Christ, we now have a new desire to live for Christ. Every time that you choose to obey rather than taking the easy way out, your actions demonstrate the power of Christ's forgiveness. There's a distinct quality about your life. We call that here the fruit of the Spirit. It's one way that through our obedience, we show the work of God in our hearts. So let's say you deliver a bag of groceries to your elderly neighbor instead of spending the money on the movie ticket that you would have bought if you weren't Christian. That act of faith is an act of God. That little story of the power of His grace, of the power of your flesh, is a part of the, the heavenly chorus praise that we'll be able to sing in heaven. Revelation 15 tells us. God's reorienting your priorities to His redemptive kingdom purposes, even in loving the common kingdom. Uh, all right, second. Because your neighbors are made in God's image, and when you love them, you show the love worthiness of the God that they're like. That's why the work of neighboring shows off the goodness and glory of God because your neighbors are made in God's image. And when you love them, you show the love worthiness of the God they're alike. And you're showing them that the God of all creation can love them. 
You know how many people don't believe that? That they're not worthy of love in our day and age? It's a powerful, powerful thing. Uh, Third, in loving others, you act like Christ and show others what He's like. Assuming your neighbors know that you're a Christian, remember we talked about that last week, like do they know your conduct advertises the truth? You're an ambassador. What kind of an ambassador would go to Germany and hide his American flag? It wouldn't be an ambassador. We'd call that a spy. <laughs> no. Think about 1 Peter chapter 2. He says this in verse 12. He says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We put Christ on display. Show what He is like. Christ didn't come to be served, but He came to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. You cannot be such a good person that you love others into the kingdom. though. So, okay? So I want you to understand that. We're not, we're not redeeming them by loving them enough. We'll love them into the redemptive kingdom. There's ultimately an offense to the cross of Christ and the depravity of heart that only God's Spirit can overcome, but your right conduct, your love of neighbor, can be used by God to begin to correct the lies that have filtered into their hearts. You can probably see that most accurately in how a parent's actions shape their children's perception of who God is. To a lesser degree, the same goes for your neighbors. All right, number four. When you act like God putting his character on display, being an image bearer, acting like him in love, you learn more about the glory of who God is. Like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't affect my neighbor. You're right, it doesn't. It affects you. It's an amazing feeling to mentor somebody in your neighborhood or maybe to to care for somebody. And over the years, through your influence, you see maybe a, a path of wisdom or By God's grace, somebody come to faith in Christ. Do you realize that when you do that, you're experiencing a God-like pleasure? You're witnessing someone, God transforming them moment by moment by moment. And it would be a pleasure that you now understand like you never did before. By imitating God in this small way, you now know through experience a little bit more of how glorious and good God is. By imitating God, you're probably never again read the story of the prodigal son, I think, in quite the same way. Because you've tasted some of it yourself, right? All right, number five and the last one. When we learn more about how God really is, He takes pleasure in that. When we learn more about how good God really is, He takes pleasure in that. Think of how much fun it is to show a child something you love. I'll never forget the first day taking the kids out on a sailboat to demonstrate the the things that I've loved to be able to do. Maybe it's the look in their eyes when they throw a football or a perfect spiral. I remember that day, watching Dan throw a spiral and him just lighting up. Or when they first see that beautiful mountain vista that you love so much, there's that satisfaction of saying, yes, see, it's amazing, isn't it? I'm guessing that's what God feels like when we discover beauty that's been hidden in this world. The first time you saw that beautiful mountain vista, He was watching you. Yes, see what I made? It's amazing, isn't it? Or more to the point, that's what God feels when we love others sacrificially like He does. That's why I came. I gave my life as a ransom. I sacrificed for them. Our rule, our Our command, if you will, from Genesis 128 is to represent God's rule. And the order we bring to this creation is His order. The order He created this world to have. God created this world to be ordered in peace and in love. So when we make that more of a reality in a little bit of this world, I believe He rejoices in us rediscovering how good His creation can really be. How good our God really is is well that's our time for this evening but i'll I'll leave you with these two things this present world is passing away why should we love it 
Because our love reveals the goodness and the glory of God by demonstrating the power of His work both in us and through us. By showing the worthiness of those made in His image. By advertising what God is like both to our neighbors and to ourselves. By giving God pleasure as His great worth is appreciated and enjoyed. John Piper is quoted once as saying, Missions exist because praise doesn't. When someone sees the glory of, and goodness of God put on display, it shows them and teaches them something more about who God is. We need missions to go and tell other and show other people what God is like because praising God doesn't fully exist throughout our world. The last few weeks of this class, uh, over the next few, two weeks, um, <coughs> are all about these two things. Loving at the level of an individual. And so we'll take a look at that more personal one-on-one -on -one for you to your neighbor next week. And then the fourth week, we'll take a look at loving at the, the level of, of neighborhood. Um, and really, we're going to kind of bleed into that next week. And then fourth week, we'll finish it out and take a look at what is it for us as a church to love our neighborhood. Uh, but really, in all of this, we're talking about how do we take the love of God and put it on display? Love doesn't ask what's in it for me or do I have to. No, love simply seeks to act as Christ has acted toward us. 1 Corinthians 5.15 reminds us of this. He, being Christ, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. May we all seek to love in this way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord. We thank you for the great love that you have for your creation and for your people. Lord, a love that did not consider equality with God something to be understood, but in humility sought to humble himself and come in the form of human flesh, to leave the redemptive kingdom and come to the common kingdom to put on flesh, live the life we could not live, obey the way we could not fathom, and purchase something we could not obtain. Life and life everlasting found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would help us recognize in the midst of our hearts the roadblocks and the blinders, Lord, that limit us from loving unconditionally as Christ has. That while we were still yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ came and loved us. Lord, I'm deeply convicted. I do not love my enemies. I do not even love fully my some acquaintances. Lord, give us all hearts and eyes to see as you see, to see image bearers made in your image who have dignity, value, and worth, and we can love them not because of what they bring to our lives, but because of what you have given in our lives. Father, may it be so in our hearts and in our people, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to open up for any questions. We've got about five minutes. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I knew it was. I knew it was going to be. Absolutely. Don, for those who are watching, um, the, the comment is that this is a, a difficult topic. It's a hard one. Um, it's one that we, but when we need to be considering and mindful of and not fall into two extremes. Um, and yet understanding that the redemptive kingdom is of utmost importance. It is where our allegiance lies. So I am first, we are first and foremost kingdom citizens and secondly, Americans or people here on earth, you know, earth, earthly kingdoms. So. Any other questions, comments? Yes, John. Uh, of the la of neighboring is one way that through 
uh, neighboring is one way that through our obedience we show the love of God uh, off. So, to put it simply, when we walk in obedience to God's commands in the Scripture, we put on display His glory. So we put off a, a distinct quality about ourselves when we walk in joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We, it's one of our outcomes here, right? We call it fruit of the Spirit. But we demonstrate, as we walk in obedience to God, a, a distinct quality about who He is. So the way we act demonstrates that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, as always, if you have other questions, feel free to email, to reach out to uh, myself um, or Len. And um, we'll look forward to having everybody back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel um, right here. Uh, I would caution you, if you didn't realize on the way in, please watch your step on the way out. The parking lot is very slippery. I want to make, make sure that everybody gets home with both knees. So, okay? All right. Have a good evening, everybody.